A while back I was reading some small introductory pamphlets on Buddhism, and there was a common pattern. He started out by saying that Buddhism is a religion of self-reliance. And then a few pages later they would say, but Buddhism teaches there is no self. And it's amazing that anyone, after reading those brochures, would continue to be interested. The first statement is actually true. The Buddha teaches us to rely on ourselves. If we're going to find happiness in life, we have to develop qualities of the path — virtue, concentration, discernment, or develop mer meritorious activities, generosity, virtue, meditation. And in the course of doing that, we develop a very strong sense of self, a healthy sense of self. But as the practice develops, we find that the sense of self becomes more more just a concept that we use. It's a tool that we use. And as long as it has its uses, we continue to hold it. It's like a, more like a toolbox. There's lots of different selves in there, and some of the selves will be useful for part of the time, and others will be useful other times. There comes a point, though, where you find the ultimate happiness, and you don't need any tools anymore. That's when you can put them all down. But before you put them down, you've got to learn how to use them well. Otherwise, you can't get to the point where you can put them down. That may seem ironic that part of being a strong sense of self, or having a strong sense of self, is that you try to make the self as harmless as possible. The harmless ones in there are the ones that you want to encourage. We tend to think of people with a strong sense of self as sometimes being pretty careless in their treatment of other people, but that's not genuine strength. And the more you harm others, the more you're creating a debt. And the more debts you have, the weaker you are. So we're trying to live a life that is as debtless as possible. So we look inside to develop the qualities that we need for happiness. So we need to rely less and less on other people. We develop our own mindfulness, we develop our own concentration, our own discernment. So as we go through life, not only as we're sitting here meditating, but also as we deal with other people. We can be as light as possible. And Jean Suat used to make a lot of this. He was saying the Buddha teaches a lot about not, this is not self and that's not self, but then he gets to that passage we chanted just now, I am the owner of my actions. That's what you want to focus on, because that's where you are responsible. And this is our motivation for developing the mind, because all our actions do come out of the mind. Many of us come to meditation for rest and respite, but we stay because we see that once the mind has rested, it can be a lot more skillful in how it deals with situations around us. It's just important that you keep in mind that as long as you're acting, there's going to be some burden on other people. For example, the precepts. The, the, Precept against killing is just that you don't kill and you don't order other people to kill. Sometimes you hear it as a precept of total harmlessness, but that's impossible. Even when you live a vegan lifestyle, it's a burden on some people. The people have to work in the fields, the bugs that get sprayed. Even with organic produce, it's not that they don't use pesticides, they've just figured out organic pesticides. So we live a relatively harmless life, as best we can. And in the areas where we do have control over things, we try to be totally harmless. And it keeps turning us back on ourselves. Where do we have the strength to maintain that harmlessness? Because it requires a lot of care. And the things we used to depend on other people for, we've got to find resources within ourselves. 
So we can go beyond what's just bright action and turn those bright actions into what the Buddha calls actions, neither dark nor bright. Those are the ones that take us out of the cycle entirely. That's when you can be totally harmless. This is why they say the Arahants are the only people who live in the world without any debts at all. They're still eating the food that other people give them, but the merit that those people gain from feeding the Arahants, even the animals that were killed, in case animals got killed someplace in the process, they get merit too. In other words, the goodness that the Arahants pump back into the world more than compensates for them, whatever burden they still place on it. But for the rest of us, we're still in a position where we are creating burdens, so we want to keep them as light as possible. Now, this doesn't mean that you don't accept help from other people when they, when they volunteer it. I saw a case years back. There was a former policeman in Singapore who was constantly afraid of being in, in debt to other people, and he was living pretty poor. He was, he'd retired from the police force and he was living on a very small pension. A group of people one time came to bring some food to me, and this one woman had prepared extra food so that he could take it home for him, for him and for his mother. And he refused it, her gift, and she cursed him. <laughs> Literally, she said, I curse you, <laughs> three times. That's being too worried about having deaths. And when people voluntarily give you help, you accept it. Unless the help is inappropriate in one way or another. But for appropriate help, you don't those are the kinds of debts you don't mind. That's the one that's where you're imposing on other people against their will. That's what you've got to watch out for. And try your best to be as light as possible on the world in general. And the Buddha talks about the principles of the practice that have to do with other people. A primary one is being unburdensome. And to be unburdensome, you learn how to be content with what you've got. And to be content with what you've got, you've got to develop your sources for true happiness inside. This keeps coming back to what you're doing right here, trying to develop a sense of well-being that you can feed on inside, so you're not feeding on people outside. This is why developing the pleasure of concentration it's not a bad form of clinging. You may be clinging to it, but you're clinging to something good. It's a good attachment. Because if you don't have this form of pleasure, you're going to go sneaking out and finding your pleasure in other places, not all of which may be skillful. So learn to develop the strength of concentration, the strength that comes from having a sense of pleasure and well-being that you can feed on. Now, it's important that you have the right attitude toward it as you're focused on, on the breath. In other words, you stay focused on the breath and not on the pleasure. You focus on the breath in a way that gives rise to that sense of pleasure, but then you let the pleasure do its work. You don't have to go running after it. As long as you're producing it, you've got what you need. And the pleasure will do its work. You just allow it to spread around the body. It's in this way that the Buddha said when he was practicing that you know, he was practicing austerities. He didn't let the pain of the austerities overcome his mind. But when he found the pleasure of concentration, he didn't let the pleasure overcome his mind. That didn't mean he, just, he stopped doing the concentration. He continued doing it and got deeper and deeper into it. But he stayed focused on his object and kept producing the pleasure. Because as you said, if you don't have this kind of pleasure, then you keep running back to the pleasure of sensuality. Even though you may know the drawbacks of sensual pleasures, you can contemplate that list of the 32 parts of the body that we chanted just now, over and over and over again. And think about all the other drawbacks of the pleasure, sensual pleasures. But if you don't have an alternative, the mind's going to go sneaking out again. So you've got to develop this source of well-being inside. This is how you become harmless. This is how you become strong. Because the harmlessness does 
the strength lies in the harmlessness. When the Buddha began to get disillusioned with his austerities, he recalled the time when he'd gotten the mind spontaneously into jhana when he was a young child. The first question he asked himself is, why am I afraid of this? Is there anything blameworthy here? Now, blameworthy pleasure would be one that causes harm to other people, and two, it cl would cloud the mind. There's a lot of pleasure in the world that clouds the mind and harms other people, but this doesn't. So he realized, okay, this was a pleasure that he didn't have to be afraid of. So he worked on it, developed it, learned to tap into it whenever he needed it. So allow yourself to find what way of breathing gives the most pleasure, what way of settling the mind with the breath gives the most pleasure. And it's a skill you need in order to go through the world both with harmlessness and with strength. <laughs>